Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever in the world this finds you. I hope it finds you well. Thanks for joining us on this webinar today. Uh, we will be talking to Brendan Lars, who is the editor-in-chief of our flagship title, The Journal of Gemology. And we'll be speaking to him live from California, and I'm sitting here in London today. We're going to be reviewing the latest edition of the Journal of Gemology, the third issue for the year, and we will be highlighting just a tiny fraction of the fantastic content in this issue. What is the Journal of Gemology? Now, for those of you who are joining us just for the first time, let me run through a couple of things. It is our academic flagship title. We have a second title known as Gems and Jewelry, which is uh, more general in the content it provides. It is not peer reviewed and it is not, um, citations are not credited. Uh, the journal is the serious one. It's been out since 1947. That's a continuous run of 73, 73 years four issues a year, and we have a very distinguished list of 45 associate editors uh, with, who bring experience and knowledge and help to ensure proper academic rigor in, in all the articles. It is a very valuable uh, membership benefit, and right at the end of this presentation, I will be discussing with you how to get your hands on the, the journal. Uh, but we'll leave that for later. Now, without further ado, let me introduce Brandon Lars, who has been uh, the editor for a number of years, and ask Brandon if he could switch on his camera and microphone and join us. Hello. Good morning, Brandon. Nice to How see are you. you. Great. Thank you very much for joining us, and it's it's really good to see you again. Thank you for giving us some of your valuable time and congratulations on putting another issue to bed. Well done. Thank you. Now, this has only just come out and it is winging its way right now to the members. So please do not be alarmed if this hasn't reached you yet. Uh, we're, we're hot off the press here and we're going to just excite everyone with, with a few things. So do tell us about this issue, Brendan. This is now the second one that you've done uh, with coronavirus uh, around the world, making things difficult on everyone. How did it go? Overall, it went really well. Um, this is uh, one of those things we're able to do remotely because our authors are all over the world. So it's nice to be able to um, not have to worry about running into a, an office or a lab that's closed these days. However, I should mention that uh, many of our authors do have that concern. And um, this particular issue, we were working with a particular author during the revision stage. It was during the height of the coronavirus lockdown in his country. And uh, he needed to go into the office to access some of his files and take care of uh, looking up some of the, the information that was requested by the reviewers. And um, he really wasn't allowed to do that. So. He was very uh, driven and, and loyal and stealthy and decided that he would block out all the windows so no light could be seen when he switched his office light on, left the lights off in the hallway, uh, kept all the air conditioners off and, except for one just enough to keep himself comfortable and snuck into the, to his office repeatedly to do the revisions on one of these articles in the issue. So it ended up working out just fine. But I, uh, I do want to commend the efforts of our authors during these tough times to get the work done. Such dedication and, and such determination. Uh, mm -hmm. Fantastic. It's, it's really good of them. And, and um, it is great to see that this came out as, as scheduled. And uh, it, will be, it will be really exciting to, to run through some of the things we have here. Before we move on, uh, I just want to give you a little bit of feedback that we got from our last chat. Now, the one of our very erudite members, uh, Mr. Harold Killingback, mm -hmm. sent us an email saying, we need to give you a little bit of credit for just how much support 
indeed coaching you provide to all of the authors and how fantastically important and helpful it is. Mm -hmm. So without, with, without um, flattering you too much and without you being too modest about this, can you run through a, a little bit of, of the process that, that is involved in, in bringing uh, authors to, to publication like this? Sure, yeah. When um, we receive a manuscript from an author, uh, it's usually in the form of a Word file with some image files. And we take that and we, if it's a feature article or a gemological brief type of article, we will prepare that for the reviewers and anonymize the manuscript. So we remove the name of the author, send it to the reviewer for the double blind peer review process. And then after collecting comments from at least three reviewers who are all experts in the field, um, based that are oriented towards the technical content and the things that the author should look at, maybe correcting if there are errors or things like that. We then compile all the comments together and we return those to the author for um, sort of a one cohesive document that they can then evaluate the, re the comments from the reviewers. Um, for manuscripts that are not peer reviewed, like for gem notes, for example, we simply take those and we do an in-house edit. And so in both cases, um, regardless of whether if it's peer reviewed or not, after the author makes any revisions from the reviewers, then mm -hmm. we will go ahead and do an in-house edit and then we'll, we'll take the English and make sure, because we work with a lot of authors who speak English as a second language. Yes. And when we make sure that the English is, is up to par and very understandable. And we also have to keep in mind that when you are publishing for a diverse audience that also speaks many languages, that the English needs to be very um, understandable and straightforward. And so we also try to edit the English so that it's not too complicated and too technical. We can explain technical subjects, but in such a way that people, regardless of their English knowledge, can hopefully understand it. So we work with the authors during the editing stage on that. And then in addition, we will work with the figures that the author supplies. So the photos themselves, we may do some op optimization of those image files to make sure that what's being shown is as clear as, and mm -hmm. as understandable as possible. We might uh, do some cropping or, or some color adjustments and things so that what's shown on the photo looks exactly as much as possible what, what the author is actually trying to show in the article without um, doing any addition or, or undo edits that don't reflect what's actually shown in the photo. Um, then if there's any line art in the form of say maps or spectra or, or other diagrams, we will then, we have a professional artist who will then redraft those into a, a synergistic style for the journal so that everything has a consistent look and mm -hmm. it's very clean and easy to read and, and follow. And then when that's finished, um, we, we send the article to that same artist and they put it together at layout stage in a very nicely um, presented fashion so that the images are all called out next or appear next to where they're called out in the text. The, the tables are right there. The, everything is laid out in a way that's, that's nice for the eye as well as for understanding what you're reading when you're trying to go through the article. So it's, it's quite a process. It, it certainly is. It certainly is. But it, to to give you the credit where where Harold Killingback meant it, um, it, this is this is down to to you directing things. And I think uh, I think a lot of the contributors out there are, are very grateful. In particular, those who for whom English is not their first language. It's it's mm -hmm. great to have you out there in the world of gemology providing that service, and and uh, which results in such a fantastic end product. It's great. Thank you. Now, you that 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 cover image, I, I I can't get past it without giving it a mention. I mean, in the world of of gemology, we have we have <laughs> celebrity jeweler designer, we have uh, celeb celebrity carver, and indeed celebrity photographer. That's that's fantastic, and and it's a wonderful cover image there. The contrasts are great. Yeah, the um, the cover turned out really nicely this time. What we're what we're highlighting is one of our feature articles in this issue on um, a chalcedony variety that is colored mm -hmm. by um, chrysocolla, uh, trace amounts of particles of chrysocolla. So most people refer to it in the trade as gem silica, um, but it's 
chrysocolla chalcedony is what it's commonly referred to by gemologists. So this particular piece, um, which features chrysocolla chalcedony as the carved centerpiece, as well as the pear-shaped cabochon, um, is called George's Dream. It was a, a designed by Glenn Lair and um, Paula Crevache together in a collaborative effort. And it's one of 12 pieces in um, what's called their Synergy Symbiosis Collection that they have been working on over the past 10 years. And with the exception of one other piece, this is the only time that the uh, any of the pieces are being shown to the public before they're publicly unveiled. And uh, the plan is for them to be going to a, a museum for display in uh, about four months from now. And there they will be for everybody to see sort of for the first time. Uh, so we feel very fortunate that um, they were gave us the permission to show this before it was it was officially unveiled to the public. And then Arasa Weldon took the photo, did just a wonderful job capturing the essence of the piece as well as the, the different colors and textures. And so we, uh, we think it really illustrates that article quite well. She, she did a fantastic job, and that really is quite a scoop you got there. Mm -hmm. um, Arasa is, of course, going to be uh, one of the judges for, for the JMA photo competition later this year. Great. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better person. That's great. But thank you. Now, let's move on and take a quick look at, at what essentially, I, I mean, there was so much there. This is essentially a very random selection of, of just what uh, awaits the reader in, in, uh, in this new issue. So let's move on and, and uh, take, a, take a look at what we have here. Um, first up, we pulled out this, uh, this, this gem note on page 244. And we say it's the second opal of uh, from Indonesia with with an insect inclusion, um, but actually it's the first with a true insect as opposed to to um, to just a shell. Could could you tell us more about this? Sure. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a really interesting phenomenon because until last year, it hadn't been documented in the gemological literature, at least that you could have an insect being entrapped with an opal as opposed to amber. And everybody thinks of um, insects being entrapped in amber because you have this sticky mass that the bugs may be crawling around on and they got trapped on um, during some in some tropical forest long ago. But in this case, we have um, opal as a, as a stone that's capturing these insects, which is a fascinating and new development uh, that, that's been reported. Um, the first time this was documented in the gemological literature, uh, an opal that resulted from weathering, meaning rather than a hydrothermal activity or something, yeah. it's from the um, decomposition of volcanic glass, high silica volcanic glass by groundwaters, which percolate through, they become saturated in silica, and then they redeposit in the form of a gel or, or a siliceous solution that then congeals into opal. And there's one deposit area within Java in Indonesia that produces this type of opal that has had these insects entrapped. Um, the first time this was reported was in January of 2019, and it made quite a splash in the, in the, in the literature where um, a lot of uh, news outlets grabbed a hold of the story, including National Geographic and, and the Smithsonian and uh, lots of interesting, lots of interest in general in the fact that you could have an opal that entraps mm -hmm. sex. And that um, was actually, they, they think it was, well, first of all, to back up for a minute, after the initial announcement, it was then documented in the gemological literature briefly. And then um, later on in 2019, there was a, or in 2020, excuse me, there was a, uh, in June, a comprehensive article published by some scientists who did some CT scanning of the fossil and determined um, with great accuracy, they identified it was a cicada uh, insect. Yep. And <clears throat> that specifically it was what's called an exuvia, which is the um, exoskeleton that is shed during various stages of the, of the growth of the insect. And this occurred during its underground uh, stage. So cicadas have a life stage in which they live most of their, their time underground, feeding on roots and things like this and organic debris. And then they emerge as, as the fully grown um, adult version 
typically with wings and they fly away and, and complete their life cycle. So <clears throat> the, the model that was presented in this article that, that looked at the formation of the first fossil was that the opal bearing solutions came down and entrapped this exoskeleton and then formed the opal around it. And there was even some areas that showed beautiful play of color. So you combined what would be an attractive opal specimen with a fossil that was uh, entrapped and it was just a wonderful piece. Um, everybody thought that was the only one until now. And we were fortunate enough to report on the second one in this issue of the journal, which um, just came out. It was discovered in January of this year at a, <clears throat> a local market in Indonesia. And then it was obtained eventually by a mineral dealer by the name of Rob Levinsky. And he uh, showed the specimen to me in Tucson and um, noted, you know, asked me what I thought about it. And, and uh, I thought it was very, very notable and unusual. It did not look in any way like it was uh, faked or somehow uh, constructed. And he, he had also shown it to a variety of experts in the field who deal with paleontology and they, they determined that it was some sort of a bee uh, species that was in there. And I, I suspect maybe, I, I don't see obvious wings on the insect. Yes. And I'm wondering if it may be a larval stage of a bee that lives underground for part of its life. And there are solitary bees that have a life cycle mm -hmm. on the ground for part of their time. And, and that's where it would have had a good opportunity to be um, enveloped by the opal bearing solutions. So, because it's hard to imagine, for example, a flying insect, you know, being yeah. entrapped in opal, but something that spends a bit of time underground, you can see that yes. happen. Yes, so, well, I think bumblebees uh, live underground, don't they? Yeah, so, so yeah, some varieties like bumblebees, for example, that, so um, anyway, this, this specimen um, it appears to be the second known species or known specimen that has a, an insect species entrapped. And it is um, going to be up for auction, actually, the heritage auction coming up, um, I believe, next month. Um, so it'd be interesting to see uh, what happens to it. Uh, just as an aside, um, one of the experts that I that I speak with and who deals with Indonesian opals had mentioned that um, there are other types of interesting inclusions that have formed in this type of opal from this deposit. And mm -hmm. he suspects that there may be a variety of these insects which have been entrapped before, but in the um, gusto to remove inclusions, you know, during the cutting process that a lot of this stuff is cut in the local market there, chances yes. are that many of these insects have been systematically, you know, removed by, by the saw while they're preparing them. Uh, for okay. so, but now that we've got the word out that these are really unusual and valuable pieces, mm -hmm. I suspect there'll be more coming out that uh, now that people are aware of them. Oh, that, well, that, that would be really good to see more of them because that's that's quite fascinating. And I am assuming that with the way they had to like that particular photograph, that 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 image there, we've lost the play of color. But I understand that this really is opal with a good play of color. Yeah, there's a little, actually, there's just a little bit of play of color on this particular oh, okay. specimen. Yeah, yeah it's just kind of the tip. Um, but it is fairly transparent to semi-transparent, so you got at least a good view of the of the insect in there. Okay. Right. Well, let's move on to our next uh, interesting piece, which is this aquamarine crystal from Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, with with uh, an elongated growth channel and a two-phase inclusion in there. That that is quite remarkable because that that that's a fabulous specimen of a crystal to begin with. It's large at, at 89 millimeters. And and to have uh to have that inclusion running or that, that bubble run almost end to end is is quite something. Yeah this was a this is a really neat piece. Um another example of the value of going to the Tucson gem shows because um just like the opal specimen that we talked about previously, this particular aquamarine was something that came out, so to speak, at Tucson and uh, was shown to me by uh, a rough stone dealer named Steve Ulatowski, who was very pleased to have acquired it actually at the show. And it wasn't in his hands for very long because uh, obviously with, with such an interesting piece, it was uh, resold very quickly. Um, what's happening here is uh, right in the center of the crystal is a very uh, relatively large size growth channel that's mm -hmm. filled with fluid, except for one place that has a, a little bit of gas in there forming a, an air bubble. And so it starts on the left side, about a third of the way down, you'll see kind of a cloudy area. There's a growth disturbance there. 
that's where the channel starts and it extends all the way to the tip of the crystal on the far right side to the termination just under the termination just a, a couple of millimeters under the termination so the bubble has uh, a long distance of travel and as you take the, the crystal and you tilt it one way or the other it's almost like a, a builder's level and that the the bubble will slowly um, yeah. migrate from one end and then back to the other completely freely traveling along that that growth channel so um, it's it's very common for aquamarine from pegmatites to display elongate fluid inclusions but to have a fluid inclusion of this size and length uh, that with this in such a transparent crystal that you can easily see the bubble is is very unusual, and it was uh, it was just a joy to 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 candle the, the piece and play around with it a little bit. And interestingly, um, when you look carefully on the termination on the far right side on the flat termination, there was a little dimple that corresponded to where the end of the growth channel was, um, where it ended just underneath the the crystal surface and. I think that probably represents the surface manifestation of a growth dislocation that occurred, what they call a spiral dislocation, that occurred yes. as a result of this, um, some sort of a disturbance that propagated down the entire crystal and, and formed along with this channel. So it was a really interesting piece. I was, yes, we've only got the one little picture there, but I don't yeah. know how well people can see that. But it, you've illustrated it really well in 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 the journal itself so yes people will will see because that that end termination is fabulously clean it really is um that that's that's a, a fantastic example that would go well in anyone's collection that mm -hmm. now moving on next we've we've got a bit of a treat here for everybody um this is a new find from afghanistan and i will let you introduce uh, the story, shall we? Uh, shall I? And and then we'll launch into our special treat for our viewers. Sure. So it's as you know these days, um, it's pretty unusual to find a brand new gem locality uh, producing attractive gem quality material. Um, most of the production we see in the market these days consists of existing localities that are mined mm -hmm. a little further, and we find a little bit more. Um, this case, it's a brand new locality. Um, producing pink diaspore from Afghanistan. Um, diaspore, as most people know it, is, is, uh, comes from Turkey. Generally, it uh, shows a color change from kind of a, an olive green to kind of a lavenderish color. This material does not show a color change. It's just a, a straight pink to purplish pink. And it was initially discovered or, or at least brought to the trade in March of 2020. Um, we were fortunate to have Mark Smith, a gem dealer from Bangkok in, uh, in Thailand, bring this to our attention, and he obtained right off a fairly sizable amount of the production. Uh, we still don't know how much is going to be coming out, but um, he shared the story with us um, and then was collaborated with the, the, the Institute, the uh, GIT in, in Bangkok, to do a gemological characterization for this gem note. Okay, so what I will do right now is share with everybody um, something special that that Mark and Valaya put together for us. And I hope this has come up for everybody now. And I'm Mark Smith of Thai Lanka Trading in Bangkok. In mid-March this year, 2020, we were shown an interesting new variety of diaspore apparently from the Goshta district of Nangahar province, Afghanistan. The color is a dusty pinkish, pinkish purple, and can be very attractive, and it can come in quite large sizes. The color is significantly different than the typical Turkish material. Uh, it does resemble some diaspora that's found in Mogok, but the stones in Mogok are generally very small and very rare. Perhaps cut stones one or two carats would be the maximum for Mogok. We first heard of this deposit in the middle of March when we got a call from a friend in Afghanistan and saying he had sent some rough and cut stones to Bangkok for us to look at. We were able to buy a very nice cut stone which we recut to 23 carats and we bought a few pieces of rough to practice cutting diaspora. Uh, apparently, 
The deposit was found in early to mid-March by a shepherd about two hours from Tur Raga village, which is about 15 or 20 kilometers from the Pakistani border. A doctor from Kunar province, a gem producing province, was visiting in the area and he saw the rough from the shepherd and he, the doctor visited the site and encouraged local villagers to dig. He recognized it as potential gem material. We have a short video that my Afghan friends, friend sent to me which shows the deposit, at least part of the deposit. It shows perhaps several dozen village people up there digging with hammers and picks and it looks quite disorganized, but all in a local, small localized area. Uh, we have no idea the extent of the deposit and maybe they don't either. Maybe they, uh, I don't know if they've done much exploration in the area. Uh, the villagers dug in the area for two months, March and April, and apparently most of the production, most of the stones coming onto the market now, were dug in that time period. In April, a local elder objected to the mining and asked the government to shut it down, which they did. There probably are still some village people quietly going up there and digging, but uh, basically the deposit is closed right now. The villagers have petitioned the government for permission to mine and apparently are determined to start digging again, whether they have permission or not. Uh, as is apparently typical of other diaspora deposits, the yield is very low from the rough material brought down the mountain. Apparently only about 1% can be cobbed out into clean gem cutting rough. And when this is cut, the yield is also quite low due to the necessity of orienting properly for the best pink color and also due to the cleavage in the material. The gemological properties of this new diaspora are very typical. The specific gravity, refractive index, and so forth are quite typical of diaspora. Um, the coloration, the pink-purple color, apparently is a combination of iron, chromium, vanadium, and manganese. Manganese being a very uh, powerful chromophore. Uh, as is probably typical of other diaspora, the pleochroism is just fantastic uh, in the purplish ones, uh, showing almost colorless in one direction and intense magenta in others. Most of the stones that we've been able to cut are under five carats. There are a number from five to 10 carats, and there are occasionally stones from 10 to 50 carats, the largest, nearly 50 carats, the largest we've cut and the largest that our Afghan supplier is aware of is a stone that we cut weighing 46 carats. Um, over the last six months, a number of parcels of, of rough stones have come into Bangkok. Uh, the majority of the material is somewhat beige. My Afghan supplier refers to the three different colors of the rough material. The majority is beige or yellow in almost all directions. A better material shows beige or yellow in one or two directions and pink in another. And the best material, the pleochroism, is beige in one but pink and purple in, in another two directions. Uh, this cuts a beautiful pinkish stone, somewhat dusty, but pinkish with purplish colors in some directions due to the pleochroism. Um, this is to show the color variation in the new Afghan diaspora. The small stones are generally quite light and they range from nearly colorless, in the case of these, um, through a medium pink, a light medium pink. I don't have any brown ones here, but there are some pinkish brown stones in this, in this size range also. The larger stones can be quite a beautiful medium pink or pinkish purple. This one is almost magenta, absolutely beautiful color. These show a little more of the brown. Uh, in terms of uh, color shift, we haven't noticed that any of these have a significant change. There's never any greenish tint, but they do shift from, uh, depending on warm and cool lighting, the warm light does bring out a little more beige color and the uh, cool light does make them a little more purplish, but I'd call it only a shift, not a significant change. Uh, we have no idea of the extent of the deposit. I don't think it's been properly explored, and we have no idea what the future production will be. 
but in the meantime, it's beautiful material. It comes in very large sizes. Uh, if there's more digging done, hopefully we'll find some even bigger, better stones than this beautiful material. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed that. That was a fantastic contribution. Uh, thank you ever so much, Mark and Valaya. We really do appreciate it. Uh, you certainly helped bring that alive for us. And um, if any of you would like to see that again, of course, it'll be in the YouTube video. Um, thank you for that, uh, most informative. And I, those the, the, the pictures of the cut pieces, I'm sure, Brendan, you'll agree, have been have been cut with a, a great appreciation of of the color and the dispersion that that was fabulous yeah and the largest stone that he showed it briefly the 46 carat uh actually went into a collection for uh, herb and monica boda who are well-known gem collectors on the east coast of the united states and herb just informed me uh, this morning actually that in addition to that stone they also acquired a beautiful cat's eye from that deposit so Wow. Um, also that pink color. So yeah. be interesting, interesting to watch that and see what happens in the future. Fantastic. Well, it, 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 quite a remarkable location as well. The view down the valley there was, was mm -hmm. quite something, wasn't it? Very rugged. <laughs> oh, I, I really don't know how, how they managed to find these things sometimes because those, uh, those are not very populated valleys and, and, uh, somebody obviously uh, covers those hills and and just keeps an eye out for any of the indicator minerals or any of the uh, the signs that you've got something running into the hills there. It's it's mm -hmm. amazing. It really is. Um, moving on to something with an incredible color. Now this was really really eye catching. How is that for a piece of spinel? Um, let me make sure I'm showing you our screen. Have you got us now? Yeah, there it is. Right, that was my bad. I do apologize. That's me not switching screens after the video there. But there you have it. I gave you the run into the color. Just look at that. Uh, this was something again that, that came into GIT and uh, with no mention of origin. Brendan, if I were to put you on the spot, where would you suggest that maybe came from? Mm, I don't know. I mean, you, you get a lot of beautiful spinels from Burma, of course. Uh, yes. It's it's possible from there, but uh, hard to tell. Do Could you tell us anything about the, the, the significance of the testing on this, just for people who, who, uh, who, who maybe would like to understand a bit more about the colors, the color variation? Yeah. The, well, the GIT authors mentioned in their in their report on the stone that there's only one other little article they could find in the, in the literature that even documented a bicolored spinel. So, mm -hmm. it's spinel comes in so many different colors as as we know, but it's so rare to find them together in the same stone. Um, why that is, I, I don't know. I'm not sure anyone knows, but. Um, interestingly, they, they tend to occur in, in more of a monochrome color. In this case, um, the two colors, um, the, we have a purple and a greenish blue that both result from iron. Um, and there are different uh, types of iron that are causing the colors. You have iron 2 plus, iron 3 plus, yeah. and then an iron 2 plus, 3 plus, what they call intervalence charge transfer. So those all three mechanisms are working together in the stone. and uh, UV vis spectra that the authors provided showed that the greenish blue portion of the stone contains more of the iron 2 plus and more of the iron 2 plus 3 plus charge transfer than the purplish part of the stone. And that's the reason why you have the two different colors. Okay, thank you. Now, before we move on from that, what I'm going to just do is you mentioned that visible spectrum there. Now, I'm going to hold this up to the camera and point this out. Uh, I hope everyone can see that. Now, this is to the students in particular. This is really helpful uh, for you to visualize. That might have been uh, an, an advanced instrument that did that testing, but it tested from UV through visible to near infrared. And uh, that graph has marked up the, the visual uh, visible part of the spectrum. Um, so in theory, you'd be able to look for those bands if uh, 
mm-hmm. any bands that, that occurred there um, through a handheld spectroscope. I think for some of it, you'd be lucky, um, but it, it's really useful to have that indicator at the bottom of a graph. So thank you too for GIT for putting that in there. Now, we'll move on to, to one of our last ones here. Now this here is illustrates, I think, one of the hazards that faces anybody who, who likes to think that they can um, head out into the field and, and uh, go to source and, and uh, buy things and, and find fabulous samples of everything. There's always a gotcha out there, and this was one of them. Uh, Brendan, can you tell us a little bit about this? Sure. Yeah, this is a really interesting buyer beware piece. Um, again, brought to our attention by Steve Ulitowski, the same person who had the aquamarine. He makes frequent buying trips to Arusha in Tanzania. And when he was on one of his recent trips, he was offered this pebble as a rotolite garden. And it's a, if it was a rotolite garden, it would be a spectacular piece. Um, he estimated perhaps it would cut a 50 carat stone. So uh, obviously not not an inexpensive piece given that it's quite clean. Um, but interestingly enough, the pebble already had a little window polished on it, which you can see in the photo. And by being a, a knowledgeable, knowledgeable gem dealer and buyer, um, you just simply loop through that uh, through that window and you can see, Although it's a bit difficult to tell in the photo, there's a little air bubble that's located just underneath the the surface there, in the kind of upper right portion. Yeah, right there. And so it was immediately, you know, it was obvious to to Steve that it was a piece of glass that had been tumbled, which is not not uncommon to encounter um, when you're out buying gem rough. What was uncommon about this particular specimen, because it had a nice window, you could get an RI, and the RI as well as the BSG, because Steve typically travels with a little hydrostatic balance uh, setup that he can get SG values with. Um, both of them matched what you would expect for rotolite, and that's quite unusual for glass. Glass usually has much lower properties. And so in this case, uh, Steve suspected that it could be what's called nanocetal, which is a what's called a glass ceramic. Um, yeah. It's, uh, it's been around for many years. It comes in all different colors. It generally, it's a man-made material that, that consists of glass with some very, um, very, very tiny particles inside of it. Um, that's why they call it a glass ceramic, so ceramic yes. particles. And generally, it does have higher properties than most of the glass that you encounter on the market. But the properties of this stone were even higher than nanocetal. So that suggests to me that it was, chances are it was probably a high property glass that somebody had then taken and formed into this shape and put the uh, the abrasion appearance of being water worn on and then tried to pass it off as, as a garnet. Uh, Steve, when he recognized this immediately, he, he when he took it from the supplier, he brought back to the United States to remove it from the market and then inform the supplier, look, this is glass. Mm-hmm. And we, we need to take this off the market so somebody doesn't get ripped off. And so uh, for, fortunately, he was kind enough to bring it to our attention to uh, as an educational sort of buyer beware. So yes, yes. Remember that this, this stuff is still out on the market. And it follows another piece that was documented a few years ago, also in Tanzania, in a Rusha market that uh, was sold as a color change garnet and turned out to be glass, actually that, that nanocetal type material. So still on the market so watch out now this this nanocetal is sold through um uh, by the people who manufacture it essentially and i think they 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 have an outlet for it in thailand it is very easily available on the internet and they don't hide the fact it is what it is mm-hmm. um but indeed you know as as you say the metrics are are a little lower you know i think the ri of the stone uh, this particular piece was was at 1.76 with that's an SG right. 4.02 yeah. or something, yes, that's which, right. which yeah. is higher than than nanocetal. But mm-hmm. they're constantly evolving their product. In fairness to them as well, and and I think um, you and I both see every year at at Tucson that that their offerings are are ever more sophisticated. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they 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 do they do some fabulous stuff. I, I would think if if as a as a a trainee faceter, you know, you you've got some good material to work with there near CZ um, type at at far lower cost. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to move on to a feature article now, and this I I will leave you to to. Uh, describe in its entirety yourself because this is uh this was a really in-depth study here and and it's most interesting sure now this it's kind of neat because of the um there's some history here as well you mentioned uh harold killingbach at the beginning of our webinar and he actually initially published an article on this phenomenon several years ago um, in which he documented the fact that when you look at a large size um, star gemstone or cabochon, that uh, certain rays of the star will actually appear to be floating off the surface of the stone, kind of in space above the surface, whereas yes. other rays of the star will actually appear to be laying directly on the stone. And so the authors of this particular uh, study looked at that in a little bit more detail and uh, modeled the light, the way the light is bouncing off the inclusions and returning to the eye and the different orientations and determine, explain very nicely what's happening with the phenomenon. And um, one of the ways that they illustrate that in this article is with uh, stereo pairs. And I don't know hmm. if you maybe hold up that issue that you have to the camera there. And while I'm talking, we can show uh, what a stereo pair is. And what happens is you take the stone and you, you have either two different cameras on either side of the stone at different orientations that you photograph the stone with. Um, or you can take the stone and move the stone in front of one camera. So maybe we can go to the extra, to the other page, the facing page of that, and we'll see the, yeah, there, those are the stereo pairs. So what you have is are two images of the same stone taken from slightly different orientations. And um, regardless of whether you're looking at the page in front of you, holding it in front of you, or if you're looking at it on the, the screen of your computer, you, what you do is you get kind of close to the image and then you defocus your eyes. And it's a little bit hard to explain, but if you, if you do it in a way that you relax your eyes, that the, the two images will then appear to kind of merge into one three-dimensional image. So it's a way of, of capturing the three-dimensionality of an object without actually having, for example, like those 3D glasses you see in movies. I um, get it, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. you see it kind of twists your, your brain a little bit, but um, wow. but uh, it takes a little practice. And if you, I should mention that um, during the editing of this article, one of our, our editors could not make for the life of them make it happen. And she, yeah. she, noticed, she noticed or I mentioned later that she does have a bad astigmatism problem. And that so if you have okay. certain, you know, certain problems or, or issues with your eyes, you may not be able to see it. Um, but, uh, but if you're lucky enough to be able to pull the images together in a way, it's pretty cool. Um, so it what's is, happening, it is. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. really neat. So, so what's happening is the, 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 the ray that's horizontal going across yes. the stone in the same plane as your eyes is the one that, that appears to be laying on the surface of the stone. Any other ray, if it's vertical or at certain angles to the horizontal, will appear mm -hmm. to be floating up off the surface of the stone. Um, wow. Something to emphasize on this, it only occurs on large size stones because that's where you have enough distance of, the, of travel of the light path for the image to be split in such a way that you can perceive it as floating above the surface of the stone. Um, if you have a smaller stone, like for example, a, a star sapphire set in a ring or something, <laughs> you may still be able to see it if you go to your microscope and look through your microscope and there have the, the image bigger so that maybe your, your eyes can make it out. So this particular stone is the largest that, that you see on the, um, on the front page of the article. It's the largest star garnet that the authors were aware of at uh, more than 5,700 carats. So it's like it's a, <laughs> you can see it in the palm of somebody's hand. It's really a big stone. And in that case, it was the phenomenon was noticeable and very easy to see. Um, wow. Otherwise, yeah, otherwise the smaller the stone, the harder it is to see. So um, there's some, some ray tracing diagrams and things that where the authors explain how this works. But in a nutshell, that's what's happening is that certain rays appear to float 
And as you take the stone and if you rotate the stone, whatever mm -hmm. ray that the rays will rotate with the stone and whatever ray is, is closest to horizontal will, will appear to be laying on the stone itself. The other rays will appear to be floating off. And as you rotate it, this, this phenomenon will appear where the, some rays will start to float above and some rays appear to lay back down on the surface of the stone. During a 360 degree rotation, this will happen a couple of, or, or four times as you rotate it through um, the, the, the full rotation. So it's pretty neat to play with, I'm sure, in real life. Of course, most yeah. of us will have the chance to play with a, a nearly 6,000 carat uh, star garnet cabochon. But the authors also illustrated this phenomenon in a, in a beautiful star uh, rose quartz sphere. Yes. And these are actually fairly common. You see them, yeah. them stones uh, many times from Madagascar, um, displaying beautiful six rayed stars and you can, you can play with those. I should mention that um, one of the diagrams in the article is called an ana anaglyph. And what an anaglyph is, it's where they take the, the image using um, different lights. So you have a red light and a, and a blue light um, version of the image, that's it there. There's three different views showing the stone in different rotations. Um, and if you, that's the type of image that if you wear those 3D glasses like in a movie, you will actually have the same effect where, where it will make the three-dimensionality three come through. And um, this is an interesting thing that happened during the production of this um, that I should mention. The printed version, it was just mm -hmm. brought to our attention, the blue color did not come through quite enough for the um, full three-dimensionality to be expressed when you, if you're lucky yeah. enough to have a pair of these 3D glasses. Um, so what happens during the, the printing or the, the production process of, of any journal that I'm aware of is you take your images, which normally start in what's called CMYK color space, and you convert those to, um, sorry, RGB, and you convert those RGB. to CMYK for mm -hmm. screen. Yeah. And um, what, what happens when you do that is you get some colors, especially of the blues, the bright bright blues, that, that just don't appear as vibrant. There's just nothing you can do about it, really. And that's what happened in this case for the print version. So for the online version, we actually are in the process now of going back and, and substituting the original CMYK uh, or sorry, the original RGB image into that mm -hmm. uh, file. And so that when people view it on the screen, if you do have the 3D glasses, you can still see it. So just, just a little caveat about that. But all is still not lost because the main purpose of those anaglyphs isn't just to show the 3D effect because yes. you recognize that most people don't have 3D glasses laying around the house, but that you can see the separation of the two rays yeah. in their respective colors really nicely and according to how they're oriented based on the, the plane of the eye. And so you can see how they're splitting and the splitting of the rays is contributing to the floating effect that they're experiencing. Okay, well, you explain it fantastically and, and it's wonderfully illustrated there. So I think, I think everyone will find that very interesting. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the, the rose quartz spheres from Madagascar, uh, no less than Harold himself. Uh, we have a donation that sits on the marble fireplace in the reception at Gemma here in London. So anybody who does pop in um, can just perhaps ask for that to be passed over so they can witness this for themselves because uh, mm. it, this is this was a, a donation by Harold and and it's something that uh, is is a little object of fascination that that we have sitting uh, down in our reception area. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, yes, quite serendipitous that you should be speaking about it today. Just before we wrap up, what I would like to do is just drop this in here and let people know how to get access to the journal, because you've seen just what a fantastic publication this is. Uh, you really need to get your hands on it. Firstly, simple, easy, become a member. You do not need to have studied GMA's courses to become a member of GEMA. We do have an associate, uh, associate membership track and we would welcome you. Um, as a member or associate member, you will receive printed copies and you will have access to the, the electronic copies as well. Now, for the people who 
can't afford to, don't want to join us. And, and that is a terrible shame that there should be such people. But I would say to everybody out there, um, the archives right from 1947 until 2018, we normally hold a full year of issues um, exclusively for our members. Uh, but once they're, they're older, they're in the archives and they're available for free to everybody. Head over to the GMA website. Under the membership tab, there's Journal of Gemology. Take a look because Brandon and his team have gone to all the trouble of creating fantastic uh, indexes, searchable indexes. So if you are studying anything in particular, however obscure it might be, you can search these indexes. And some of them have already um, been collated into specific areas, garnets, emeralds, sapphires, etc., just to make your life easier. Do use it, do take a look, and uh, make sure you just credit the authors and, and, and the issue when, when you, you use those articles. And last but not least, let me just mention the data depository, which is also on the GMA website. So much of what Brendan does is is just too much to fit into to the magazine and he likes to make this extra material available for people who would like to to um, read that little bit more it sits in a data depository there will be a reference in the article telling you to go there and you will find this this additional information on on the website there brendan have i covered it all there do you think Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. I, I want to also make sure I send a shout out to our, our reviewers who are our associate editors who are so generous with sharing their knowledge and ensure that the articles are as correct as possible, technically accurate. So it's a, it's a real team effort to put it all together. Thank you to all of you. It, it's, it's been really great. Thanks. Good night. Thank you.